Amanda, so glad to talk to you today. We're all about product management and startup product management. We have studied together in UCLA and we've been in touch about since then about product management, entrepreneurship. And you mentioned recently you've been the first product manager a few times. And that's a new experience for me as I joined Flexia as the first product manager. I'm curious to hear a lot about your experiences on how you approached the first product manager role, what sets it apart and what helped you succeed. But I want to start with, which is in your perspective, what's the B2B SaaS product manager role? Yeah, so my whole career has been B2B SaaS and I really love that first product role. Um, I've held it a couple of times and I would say at like a high level, there's two ways I've spent my time. So in one realm, it would be with engineering, um, any design or other product resources as they you know come with the company's growth. That's kind of one chunk. The other chunk of time I would call more like go to market activities. A lot of that cross-functional collaboration. Um, so that first bucket, just digging down like one level deeper, um, working with developers on a daily basis, uh, being in uh, Jira or whatever project management tool and actually creating tickets and like taking these concepts from hey, let's make a feature that does this into like the actual granularity of what that looks like. Uh, adopting agile processes, getting sprints in place, getting the proper tooling there to support those processes and hiring and expanding the team as resources allow. Um, and just really being in lockstep with that group and kind of having that level of comfort where you can just call each other if you don't understand like what's, what's you know, there's an engineer supposed to do or vice versa if there's questions. Um, and having that sort of supportive, collaborative team environment with, you know, the actual people that are building what you're, you know, planning to that, you know, the company should build. Other chunk of the time, I called it kind of go to market. This would be things like, especially early in product roles, and I think you mentioned you've already been doing this um, in your new role, just talking to customers and like attending and kind of being a fly on the wall, joining sales calls, building good relationships there, understanding what the marketing looks like. You know, I've come in when there has not been a pitch deck and I've come in when there has been kind of some of those bones in place. So understanding like how you can add value there and make sure that the product is being talked about in a way that can help it grow and like you and sales are really aligned and think about it, you know, in the same way. Um, and that would also come with, you know, any new features or pivots in the product, things like that, having all the stakeholders at the company and occasionally like if there's external stakeholders maybe a core customer or partner having them all be on the same pages to where the product is going so those are kind of the two buckets kind of that internal engineering design product rhythm and then on the flip side um actually bringing the product to market and you know i've tended to split this into like a alpha period only people internal are using it beta we actually have a few customers on it and they're going through the motions and then more of like the full scale launch. And you can come in at any of those points um, as the first product manager just kind of depends on what the priorities are and who is has traditionally owned what a PM would otherwise be doing. I'd later also like to hear more about the alpha, beta and like gender availability, how your role might have changed over time. Before that, you also mentioned stakeholders and that reminds me of big versus small companies. I'm curious, uh, you've worked in big companies like Wellington and Google, as well as startups where you were the first PM. What were yep. things that were similar versus different? And if you could share an example, that would help a lot to understand. Yeah, I would say like similar things, like you're gonna do this in any product role, writing requirements, documents, processing customer feedback, dealing with stakeholders cross-functionally, being a part of sprints and retros and all those, you know, normal agile things. Like, I think you're going to get that in most roles. To me, the biggest difference is like, if, if you're at a startup, you're probably not as good at like the core PM skills because you're doing so much, so many other things. Um, and I know we both went to business school and kind of that more generalist background is, is really helpful in a startup, but the pressure is a lot higher. Um, so <laughs> the company might not work out it might flop and you know i've been through that before and that's just a risk you kind of have to be okay with so just kind of knowing that it might not turn into a rocket ship but you're gonna learn a ton um, from that experience and i i do think as a pm like i'm i can go and demo and pitch the product right like i <laughs> but that that's more of a sales duty but because of that startup experience um you get to touch on a lot of those different areas um 
the pace is a lot faster. So if you decide like, hey, I'm a new PM at this company and I think we should build this thing and you get the right buy-in, you can just go and do it. And two weeks later, it's like working, right? And you can go show customers. Like that process is a lot faster. There's less red tape. In startups, the one other thing I would add to that is you'll probably have more customer exposure, especially in those early stages when the product you're kind of, there's almost this like constant pivot where you're joining a call and a customer wants this and you sort of have to find that fine balance of not promising things on calls and getting in a good rhythm with sales, um, CEO in some cases, and making sure that uh, you're clear on like where, where the product is going. But you do have to be very, you know, reactive to customers in that early stage where I think bigger companies, you can kind of, you're almost more removed from that. And maybe sometimes you see customers, but it's just not going to be a, a daily thing. Right. So one example you shared is how as a startup PM, you got comfortable demoing products to your customers, which yes. a PM at a large company may not have as much exposure to. And also how you would be in a lot more customer calls and some of these might like, either you would you or the team might have a tendency to react to it and change the product roadmap or uh, or like that's something to be wary of and uh, like guard between what's possible for you to change versus what you commit on the call to change so. yeah i think that's that's been tough um you know one of the leaders i worked for was definitely a promise and says yes to a lot of things so i think there's a little bit of coaching involved too just with as a product leader at that company, working with the other um, stakeholders and especially anyone in sales to make sure that, you know, what you're saying is you can do is realistic and, you know, not like just being very like, you want to be an open ear and you want to focus on discovery. So more like problem focused rather than like, what do you want? Or like, what would make it better? Like trying to get into the problem side of it. And I've, I found that's a good way to uh, just try and prevent those scenarios where you kind of find yourself in a trap of like, oh, I guess we're going to go build this thing now because you, you don't ever want to do that live on a customer call. Something you mentioned was uh, focus on discovery. And another thing you mentioned is coaching. And I'd like to pull on that more to hear like one thing that I'm trying to figure out now is how much of a coaching or education should I do within my company to share with my colleagues what the product manager role is in my perspective uh, so that I can set expectations. Where do they engage me, where not? Uh, and I'm curious whether that's something you had to go through before and uh, any advice you have on that. Yes, um, being the first PM, like people don't know what product is. Uh, it depends on, you know, the experience of the other people at the organization, if they've been exposed to product at other companies. But I think no matter what, there's going to be a lot of that education, like almost just justification in a sense for like, here's what I'm here to do. Here's why it's important. Here's how I can help you. Ways I've done this in the past, like in my, the last startup I was at, I very early on, I just met everyone, all the customers, all the core salespeople, kind of understood like where things were and what they knew about the technology that had been built to date. Um, and at this point, there were no customers on the product. And it was more of like a, let me just see where we're at kind of perspective and letting people kind of just express and dump whatever information on me they wanted to. Once I sort of got through that, I was able to kind of move into like the, all right, let me process this and see what I can do about it and see where the gaps are. And then that led into like, all right, let's do X, Y, and Z. So for example, um, with like within the company itself, there was no transparency around like what's being built, when and why. So I was able to solve that problem by creating a roadmap, having set criteria that all the stakeholders agreed to, um, involving them in that process, uh, you know, as planning came along month by month. Um, I had a Slack channel with the you know, proactive roadmap. Here's the criteria. Here's where you can submit ideas. Here's where you can see where any ideas that you've submitted, whether your own or on behalf of a client stand and just having it be all self-service. So rather than like pinging me one off and trying to get something in, like just having very public processes and everyone sort of knows what's going on. I found that was very helpful. The other thing I would say is getting other leaders to vouch for you in that company. So once you have these processes, like it's nice, right? But it's just going to work if people are 
willing to use it and go and look at it. So that's where um, I would lean heavily on the CEO to say, all right, like this is the, what we're going to do going forward. I know you support it. Well, let's get everyone else on board. Maybe it's an all hands meeting. Um, maybe it's other, you know, channels or platforms. However, the company communicates that you're kind of pushing some of these things. Um, or if someone hits you one off, you kindly redirect them to whatever processes have been set up. And uh, having leaders also to outside of that CEO, having other people at the company that, you know, have some skin in the game, you know, like maybe it's, you know, the sales leader or someone on the customer success side that's saying, oh yeah, like Amanda created this new process for how we submit ideas. And it's really cool because we can now see where they all are and it's not a mystery and everything's, you know, out there and fully transparent and kind of getting that, you know, cross-functional vouching as well. So there's a few different mechanisms going on here. I think some of it kind of fits into that first bucket of proactive, kind of a self-serve model where you can go and get all the things you need. And then the other part of it is like actually getting people to vouch for you, um, you know, other leaders, things like sprint demos too, where the developers are proactively saying, here's what I built, like anything like that to sort of increase the just like level of trust and synergy across, you know, between product and some of those other business functions. It's sort of two, two parts. One is finding processes, helping people adopt the processes. But on the other hand, it's also building relationships and your credibility or trust. And the second part you mentioned, like being there when people are sharing, like for example, being for in there for engineers when they are sharing their work in sprint demos or okay. talking to the sales and other teams. The process side on the other hand sounds like, sometimes process to me sounds like you're putting something in between two people. The person wants to directly talk to you or, but the challenge is 100 people want to directly talk to you. So instead you're putting a process in between. And these this seems to be a balancing act. And so I'm curious whether there were some times where things didn't go as you planned or you didn't take the right responsibilities. Can you share an example where you initially assumed the wrong responsibility, maybe as a product manager at the first PM in a startup? And how did you realize that what you had taken up to be, this is what I should do is not right and course correct? Yeah, I mean, each role has had its own challenges. I'm happy to share a couple examples. Um, I'll start with the last company I worked at. I worked for a very like visionary focused CEO that had a lot of different ideas. And I think I had this <laughs> preconceived notion of like, I'll just come in and we'll just build, you know, one idea and it'll work great. But that's like a lot easier said than done. So I think in that role, I might have before I even started sort of oversimplified, like, all right, we're gonna pick one use case and we're gonna get it done. And just assumed that the CEO and the other leaders at the company are just gonna be fully on board with that. But that was not the case, right? Like you're working for someone who has like a founder brain and wants to do everything and is a very like creative visionary type of individual. Um, and I actually work really well with that type of leader because I'm, very focused and I will pick, all right, like we only have three development resources or whatever it is and this amount of time, let's find one thing that we can do really, really well. Um, so that's again, easier said than done, but in that particular role, I had a lot of conversations uh, with that leader I was working for to try and figure out, okay, we can't do everything. We don't have the resources to do everything. Um, and this was a leader that had not worked in software before. So again, kind of that upward coaching came into it where it's, there was some serious conversations around what is actually possible and what do we want to focus on? Part of that was me and that leader directly, but the other piece of it, that's where the stakeholders came in. So I aligned with all of them on like, all right, if we're going to build this product, uh, let's do it in a way that sales can best execute on it. Right. And we have relationships already in place. Um, so I worked with, you know, the sales leader, for example, to try and figure out, all right, where do we have relationships that we can leverage? So we took this, this was a B2B SaaS um, idea in the accounting space. And it was very much like, we're going to do everything in Canada. And then we're going to do some credits over here in another country and everything in this state and some green energy stuff over here. Like it was just very scatterbrained at the beginning. And by the time we actually launched a product, it was a specific set of tax credit incentives that we were focused on in a certain state where we had sales relationships already in place. 
And that allowed us to sort of accelerate a lot faster than we otherwise could, because we had like one thing, if we could do it well, and we could get a couple of clients on board, then we'd have a story that would sort of tell itself. And that sales pitch got so much easier because we had that sort of synergy and that success was kind of already there. And clients were speaking to our success rather than, uh, you know, kind of doing a lot of things in a really scatterbrained way. But that that took a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with that leader, um, making sure we were not over-promising on demos and like really narrowing it to one use case that we all agreed on. Um, sort of direct conversations with the leader I was working for. And then also that cross-functional aligning with sales, customer success, and other subject matter experts at the company on what we wanted that to be. So it was not my idea. It was something that we agreed on together and came about as a group. And then it was that much easier to get, you know, the leader of the company on board and anyone else that was, you know, peripheral to, to what we were building. Got it. It's also interesting how your example again uh, showed uh, like amplified the idea that as a product manager in a startup, you were also looking at how the sales pitch is done and how easy it became if you narrow the niche. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that helps understand it even better. Uh, and we talked about processes a bit and we talked about launching and making it easy for launch and so on. This connects mm -hmm. to the earlier thing you had mentioned was alpha, beta, or maybe general availability of a product. And I'm curious, how did have you seen the PM role change over that time at a small organization? Like I, I, as a, in a big organization like Pili or other companies, I've seen that change because the product managers are more involved with customer support or sales in earlier stages of the product and less involved and have more processes in place as the product grows. The product fails less, there are fewer incidents, but the engineering team might grow and so on. I'm curious, what have you seen in a small company that might be different? From a large company. Yeah, I'll first define both phases and then I'll talk about how the PM role is, is different in each. Um, and again, this open to interpretation, every PM role is different, every product is different. The way I've tended to approach this is when you join, alpha, beta, and then what I would just call like full scale launch are the three kind of chunks that I tend to split my time into. So that alpha period is relevant if you're joining really early and there's not customers on it yet. And it's more of a building a prototype, getting something going. Uh, no one is using it, so you can deploy and break whatever you want and build whatever you want. There's no really rules in that period. I would mark alpha moving into beta whenever it's ready to actually show some clients and get beta clients on the product. So there, some clients might have seen it in alpha, but it was very much framed as like a preliminary thing. Beta is more of, all right, we have some sort of working prototype. We want to get um, in B2B SaaS, you know, maybe it's five customers, something like that, something that's manageable uh, where you can engage with them and they're friendly. Um, this is where your network comes in. Anyone that you've kind of worked with before or sold to before that you know is going to work with you when things are not perfect. Um, that's definitely important during that beta period. And beta is where all, like, all the major pivots and changes happen. You're constantly listening to customers and things are changing as you go. Full scale launch, what I've tended to do, I did not do this the first time I had the role, but the second time I did, and I think it was really helpful, was defining what are we calling ready? Like what is the actual launch? Um, and you can have specific metrics to measure that. So it can start with, all right, we have, you know, four or five customers that are on it and actively using it, but you could dig mm -hmm. a level. Um, we have this many people logging in. Uh, the most recent platform I worked on had like a B2B to B to C angle. So like how many C's are logging in, uh, how many are like going back, um, lots of different like adoption and also re any revenue related metrics to sort of measure. All right, once we hit this threshold, I think we've like got it enough and we're comfortable enough that we can rip off the band-aid and just actually go and sell it. So this would mean I don't need to be on all the demo calls. Uh, sales can just go and run with it. Those are the three phases. The PM role specifically, I'd say early on in that alpha period, it's very engineering heavy. You're working with the developers to get it to a fully functional state. Um, so when I joined the last startup I was at, uh, when I walked in the door, 
very buggy. We didn't know like the full flow and how we were going to talk about it to customers because there was multiple perspectives involved in this platform. And that took a while to kind of work through. So getting all those key things fixed, like it had the right bones and great work had been done. Just actually getting it to a point where it's something we could demo, it works beautifully and we can kind of get through the full use case and scenario and set up some real clients. That's kind of what that first period was. So very hands-on with the development team. Um, some client exposure, but again, it was kind of more in a like, this is the problem we're trying to solve in the direction we're trying to head and kind of narrowing it down to like, this is the use case we want to do well. That was kind of that early period. Beta got a lot more sales heavy. So that's when I, like I was on the first many demo calls. Um, you know, the most recent, you know, time I had this role, eventually I rolled off and that kind of came with time as uh, the sales team grew, got a lot more comfortable with it. The product was more stable. So there was just a lot more confidence across the board. We weren't worried anything was going to break or not work during a demo, anything like that. Um, so that period was sales heavy, but it also was where a lot of those like fundamental changes happened. So we sort of moved from, oh yeah, we need to build this thing and this thing and this thing and just doing it into like a little bit more of a process, but not like, not big company process, more alignment on things like criteria. So in that last product uh, that I worked on, I had created three or four different things that we were gonna use to, as like foundation for, all right, we should build this feature. Like how well, how high do they rank on these three or four pieces of criteria? and everyone knew what that criteria was. So when the roadmap came about, uh, these are the things that are next, you know, that we're gonna build over the next month or two, there was no surprises because everyone had agreed to that criteria. So some of those formalities started to come in, but again, we're, we weren't planning very far out. This is a couple of sprints, maybe three or four, if we were really on top of it. Um, design was heavily involved in that process too. Um, and I sort of start. I started to challenge the you know design resources we had to do some of that problem space thinking. So it wasn't just like go create a mock up. It was let's solve this problem together. And this criteria is kind of driving the problems that are bubbling to the top. Uh, and then that last period, that's when I was most removed from the data. Like I was able to kind of step out of some of the sales stuff because that was working and we had a structure and we had a team in place. And that's when it was more honestly like efficiency focused. We were focused on, all right, let's get enough users on the product. Let's get enough revenue going. And sales was owning that more so than, you know, me kind of being heavily involved in that. And it was a lot of getting into a rhythm. Uh, so in that period, getting things like, uh, like automated test suites set up, just like getting our velocity like pinned down and like really executing efficiently um so that, that last phase was a little bit more on the like scaling end of the spectrum and activities that that funneled into that bucket perfect that's that's helpful to see the progression and you talked a bunch about getting feedback about your product whether it's metrics or something and i want to switch to another topic which is getting feedback about your work um, and like in big companies you have uh, maybe annual performance evaluation cycles or quarterly half yearly whatever you you mentioned how you uh, built your own system of, of keeping yourself accountable and measuring your success i would love to hear more about what you did that helped you be self accountable and have a self governing system yeah i think that that's a really important aspect especially for product roles because i think coming in the door there's a little bit of like what's this person doing or uh, maybe resistance from engineering on like are, are they going to add value or are they going to step into kind of my work and step on my toes so i i'd say relative to other roles it's it's super important like things like engineering and sales there's like objective measures that are sort of agreed upon industry-wide for is that person doing their job products i don't think that exists at least in any sort of uniform way um, startups are also a lot less likely to have like real feedback mechanisms processes systems they may not have have reviews or if they do it might be something kind of outdated or just something to say they have something but it's not this like or most often it's not like a continuous feedback 
cycle. Um, so what I have done in that situation is kind of created something if there was not an infrastructure there. If there's an infrastructure there, you can tap into it. I think you'll find that at probably like B, C stage onward, but anything before that, I'd be surprised if there was a whole lot in place. So what I have tended to do, and I have encouraged um, all my direct reports to do something similar as well, if assuming there's not a whole lot of infrastructure, setting up what you want to accomplish and making that very clear method. There's lots of different ways to do it. I've tended to lean towards like OKRs and saying, all right, in the next quarter or like some chunk of time that's small enough that you can reflect on it in a couple of months and keep that performance conversation sort of continuous rather than here's what I'm going to do over the next 12 months, which might work at a big company, but that's not going to work at a startup where like, who knows if it's going to be around in 12 months, right? Um, so things like, um, you know, in my the most recent role I had when I joined kind of during that alpha period, you know, I had, I don't know what exactly the OKRs were, but, you know, things like we are going to launch the product and have three to five beta customers. And here's how we're going to measure that. So there might be specific revenue metrics or, adoption related metrics, you know, there might have been an OKR focused on uh, like engineering output and velocity and like getting that to scale. Um, I think as a company grows, product is less involved in that, but in those early stages, you are very integrated in those processes. But having that kind of mapped out so you can, you know, if you're doing well, you can revisit that conversation with your direct leader, um, other stakeholders too. So it's just very obvious, you know, Harshal's adding value and here's how he's doing it. And these are his goals over the next few months. I tend to gravitate much more towards that. So everyone kind of knows how you're doing. Everyone's on the same page. If you're missing that, it's sort of open to interpretation and the CEO might not like something you did or some other leader might get, you know, mad about X, Y, and Z or not think you're adding, thinking you're adding value in the right ways or whatever they perceived a PM to be. So if you actually map that out and it's related to whatever the overall company objectives are, maybe it's whatever those objectives are to get to the next round of funding or maybe to profitability or whatever the company's focused on at that time. I think you're going to be a lot more, you know, set up for success and just having it out there, like over communicating, revisiting that conversation. You have to be in charge of, you know, your own career and positioning. So if that means you're coming up with that and going to your leader and encouraging those on your team to do the same thing with you, uh, I think it's going to be a lot more evident um, that you know, you're adding value to the organization. So it's, it's a little tricky and it's a little, you know, self-created, at least at those early stages. Eventually, I think there's process and things in place as you know the company may add an HR leader um, or grow that unit and these things will come about naturally. But in those early stages, it's really critical. Got it. That's uh, helpful. And uh, with that, I want to come to uh, any advice you have for, I shared my situation where I'm joining as the first product manager in, a, in Flex CI, which is also a new industry for me, building infrastructure for Gen AI businesses. And I'm curious, what advice would you give me, uh, somebody like me, who's uh, taking on the first PM role on how to succeed in the role? Yeah, there's a few things there. And I think I've gotten better at this <laughs> with each time I've done it. <laughs> Um, I would say the first thing, and I say this is especially true if you come from more of like a big company structured background, is just bias towards taking action and doing it quickly. Um, you have to have that ability to just make quick decisions grounded in some evidence, but being able to kind of just let it go and pull the trigger on things. Because in those early stages, you just don't have the time to do like all the customer research you may want to do and get all that supporting data that you need. Like you want enough so that you know you're building in the right direction. But, you know, that's one thing that, um, you know, I sort of learned the hard way. I would say another thing, talk to customers very early, get in on those calls, really challenge people. And, you know, again, coming back to that discovery point we touched on earlier with the, with clients, with prospects, like really getting into the why and what problem are we solving rather than the like, what do you need? Or how can we make you happy? Or how can we keep you as a client? Like, that's not the way to frame it. It's a lot more about like getting into the you know, nitty gritty of, of the problems. We talked about having like clear like success criteria for your role in some sort of performance measurement thing, even if it's not part of the company and just like making that very apparent. Um, Cause you want to be able to say, 
hey, I did I did a great job, and here's why, and here's where I'm, things I'm working on. Um, and it helps build credibility and just relationships, so you, you're not as expendable, which I think in those early stages is super important. You don't want to, you know, get fired for no reason or cut or whatever, get laid off. Like if you have that proof of how you're adding value, that's a lot less likely to happen. The last thing I would say would be around just having a great team culture. And this takes time and it's been a little bit different, you know, all the places that I've worked, um, but really getting in there with your developers and whoever your engineering peer is, um, the CTO type person, whoever that is, like, really getting on the same page with them and having a great synergy and like aligning on things philosophically, but making sure that you are different and complement each other really well. You want to create this environment where developers want to build cool stuff and want to be excited about it and don't just feel like, hey, Amanda's coming in and giving me a list of stuff to do. Like that, that's not ideal, right? You want them to be a part of that process. You want them to come back and be like, oh, here's a better way to do it. And like, it takes time to create that. But that that's kind of one other thing that I, I've really enjoyed. And the, you know, the most successful teams I've been on have had that like synergy and had that working and that transparency. Thank you for sharing. I love love it. Uh, there's a lot to learn, a lot, lot of insights here. Thanks for sharing all of this. Yeah, this has been fun.